Welcome to the September 5th, 2018 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, we start every meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. And I think it would be very appropriate for all of us to rise now and in honor of John McCain, say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. <laughs> Roll call. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Present. Uh, general public comments. Uh, anyone wishing to make a comment about anything that is not on the agenda tonight, uh, please present yourself at the podium. And you have three minutes. Please state your name and address. Thank you. Michael Doyle, Westworth, New Hampshire. I'm here as a reporter for FelmaToday.me and also as a future litigant against the town of Scarborough. I'm holding in my hand the Supreme Court decision on Lozman versus Rivera Beach, uh, Florida, where the case was almost identical to him being arrested and taken to jail, as it was for me. Uh, when I was uh, in court, the uh, assistant district attorney offered me a $500 fine and no jail time if I played guilty. And I said, no, I'm going to take a trial on this. And I said, I'm going to base my defense on Lozman versus uh, Rivera Beach. And the assistant district attorney didn't know what the case was about, so he wrote the, the name down. Apparently, he researched it because I filed a uh, brief to have the case dismissed with prejudice, and he chose not to prosecute the case, and the case was dismissed with prejudice. And then whoever was running the brain trust here hired Mark Franco from Drummond and Woodsum to make an appearance to have the case reopened. And the judge gave Franco the courtesy of a date to come to court, but we never even got to the tables. He dismissed it once again while we're on the other side of the bar discussing it. He said, Mr. Franklin, you have no standing here. This is a criminal case and it's been dismissed with prejudice. But thank you for coming. And that was the end of it. Now, in the case, Justice Warren, excuse me, Justice uh, Thomas pointed out three things that allows me to sue you for false imprisonment, malicious prosecution, and malicious, malicious arrest. And in the discovery, Sergeant Pearson actually admitted that she knew that the handcuffs were too tight on my right wrist and continued to abuse me uh, in a, a malicious way by keeping the handcuffs on to the point where it put a quarter of an inch gouge in my wrist and I had to go to the uh, doctor for emergency care the next day because I lost feeling in my right hand. All because you guys didn't like the questions I was asking. So you guys are going to have a chance to have the Maine Municipal Association pay Mark Franco for a defense in federal court here pretty soon, but I just wanted to let everyone in the town to know, to know what happened to the case. You guys lost not once, but twice on the same case. You hired Franco to reintroduce the case, and he was slapped down by the judge again. And Councilor Babine changed his witness statement to include disorderly conduct. You cannot charge a crime. Only the police officer can charge the crime. You can give a witness statement, so it allows me to pursue uh, a, a claim of, uh, I'm, thinking, I'm trying to think of the right word, but it, it allows me to increase my claim because of false uh, charging by Councillor Babine. I think it was, uh, I'm trying to think, it was, uh, it was something to do with uh, increasing the charge without, without authorization. He charged me with disorderly conduct without authorization. It has to come from a police officer. So I want to thank you for a chance to uh, sue you guys in federal court again. If I do this enough with practice, I'm going to get to the point where I can actually win. Thank you. You guys have a great evening. All right. Um, I'm Kristen Nilsson, uh, 23 Morning Street. Counselors, um, I, I am neither speaking in favor nor in opposition to the TIF. Uh, rather, I'm advocating for transparency and citizen input. As I've watched the coverage of the Judge Kavanaugh hearings this week, I couldn't help but draw parallels um, to the proposed TIF process for the Downs development. 
there have been two common questions in both instances. What is the rush? And is there some reason why the information has not been fully disclosed or researched in its entirety? The speed at which this council is moving, the timeline at which this council is adhering to, and the lack of due diligence that appears to the public combine to raise these questions which give the appearance of a done deal. It feels to the public that this has already been decided, possibly well before now. Distrust in our elected officials has grown exponentially in this town, and the lack of transparency with the TIF only fuels that fire. Nobody wants that. I know none of you want that. Um, so I ask you to put this to a referendum, as you have with other financial decisions and purchases in the past. A development of this magnitude will inevitably change the culture and dynamic of Scarborough, either with or without the TIF. Our town manager, Mr. Hall, um, stated the following in the August 23rd issue of The Forecaster. Hall said, ensuring the council understands the proposal and impact enough to make a well-informed decision is challenging due to the project's magnitude and cannot fathom ensuring the entire public is informed enough to cast a vote. So yes, we all agree this is very complicated. If it is too complicated for the seven councillors to fully vet and understand alone, then the decision should not be made by them alone. Bring in neutral third parties to analyze traffic patterns, personnel increases, the viability of our school and town infrastructure given projected population growth, the impact on local businesses. The list goes so far beyond my three minutes. The solution to making the decision less complicated is seeking more information in the span of more time. Not placing arbitrary deadlines based on reasons unknown. The public wants more information on the ramifications, both positive and negative. We want to know what's going to happen to our town. If the development were to go south, which I truly hope it doesn't, um, or if our taxes increase, I would like to know if that's projected to happen. My parents have owned the same house for 41 years, and their annual property taxes are approaching the original purchase price of the home. Scarborough citizens cannot afford any surprises. If this, is by, if this is approved by another five to two vote and not unanimous, this will further the appearance that the outcome was predetermined by the majority um, and that debate and public input are futile and that we may not be able to trust town officials to make decisions in our best interest. So please slow down, please put this to a referendum and please restore the public's trust in you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Paul Johnson. I live at 78 Mitchell Hill Road. Um, you know, a couple quick things before I get into the meat of my comments is the joint letter that was released by Tom Holland, Chairman Donovan, to the public and also was published in the Scarborough Leader. Uh, it struck me because there wasn't a single number in that letter. Uh, so the information that has been disseminated to the public right now has not contained a single number that's come from the town. Uh, in fact, it was very well written and tactfully shifted from quantitative benefits to qualitative benefits. And unfortunately, when you focus on qualitative benefits, it means that you don't have the quantitative benefits in line, or perhaps they don't even make sense. I think what Kristen just said about the referendum vote, I think it's the same council that's here today that <clears throat> voted five to two to hold a recall election within three weeks because, quote, the public fully understands this issue, and we believe that they can vote on this in three weeks. So I think if we're being honest with ourselves, everything and every topic and every vote is right down lines. It's not about what we think is right. It's not about what we think is wrong. It's not about an honest assess assessment of what's good for this town. It's actually about furthering our agenda or furthering what we want as five councilors. There's a ton of talk in the town right now about the decisiveness in town. We have the concerned taxpayers of Scarborough. They're just cranky and old. We have Road to Renewal, who keeps pitchforks in the back of their car, which I left mine in my trunk. And we sacrifice small lambs every third Sunday on the full moon. We have supporters of Scarborough schools who burn so much taxpayer monies, I personally witnessed them roast marshmallows over a bonfire of $100 taxpayer bills. None of this is true. But when these decisions are made, 
It's you. It's you that's enhancing this divisiveness. You're making us go in our corners. You're not bringing us to the table. You're bringing us and pushing us in our corners. That's not good governance. It's just not. So it doesn't make sense to me how the same council can vote five to two to have an election three weeks in advance. Can't fathom that the voters of this town can't vote on this in November. November is going to go, no, the, the, the big thing about November, it's going to be about this no matter what. There's, there's two avenues this is going to take. This is going to get pushed through the council. This is going to further the divisiveness. This is going to get the election as ugly as humanly possible. And there's going to be a bunch of losers. This town is going to be full of losers. Or this November can still be about this. You can take a month and a half, two months. You can strike a killer deal that benefits the developers. It benefits the town. You can spend those two months and educate this public. You can have a referendum. You can win that referendum by a two to one vote. And we all walk away happy. That's the decision here. Are we going to continue with the divisiveness? Or are we going to actually do what's right by the people of this town? Uh, Matt Scyther, 14 Huntley Drive. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, my wife April and I grew up in Scarborough. Uh, we have four kids, two are in the district, and eventually all four will be. Um, we have friends and family who teach in the district, have for decades. Um, as someone who is deeply invested in our schools, um, I'm concerned about how the TIF is going to impact our schools. Uh, nobody seems to be talking about this. Um, you have said not to worry, to trust you. Um, yet you haven't actually presented any data to back that up, to reassure me that this is not going to hurt the schools. Um, there haven't been any cost projections released to the public. Uh, how many students is this going to add to our schools? How many school buildings, buses, bus drivers, teachers are we going to need? None of that is free. So what happens if all those costs, not to mention all the municipal costs, exceed the tax revenue that we get after we give the developer their tax break? If we have this massive deficit, what's going to give? School cuts? More increases in taxes? Maybe both? Nobody wins in that scenario. Now, I'm not saying this doomsday scenario will happen, but you can't tell me it won't. Because you lack the information right now. You cannot confidently and honestly tell us the numbers work and that they won't hurt the schools. And it would be reckless to vote for it at this point, considering all the unknowns and the risk. Frankly, I think the community is being pretty reasonable about this. Like, nobody's outside protesting. Nobody's demanding you flat out reject the TIF. Uh, as far as I know, nobody has pulled recall petitions yet. Um, <coughs> all people are asking for is that you listen and take your time. That is all. And if you truly believe in this project, and it's as great as you say it is, which I, I really hope it is, then put your money where your mouth is. Put it to a referendum and let it stand on its own merit. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carl Gautreau. I live on Jambaco Mill Road in Scarborough. And I'm here, uh, like many of us, we just do not understand why you would not be considerate enough to allow the taxpayer who is supporting this project, or potential project, to go forward and have <coughs> the say in voting the TIF. <coughs> this, this process, I believe, didn't start just like yesterday. If I understand it right, it probably got off the ground somewhere in January when the land was purchased. At that time, was there a nod given to the developers that possibly a TIF could help get things through the bank and do the, those kinds of, get those kinds of signatures? I, like many of us here, are just totally lost because there is no information coming forward. And if I want to be honest with you, the town has every right and they should deserve your respect and honor a referendum vote. $150 million over 30 years is $5 million a year. 
$416,000 a month, $104,166 a week. If the TIF goes through, I hope you have numbers supporting the revenue stream that will provide that $104,000 a week for 30 years. I have a strong feeling that you all are not not digesting the numbers of this project. I have a strong feeling that you haven't really thought out the budget for this project. I'm not pointing any fingers. All I'm saying is please go through the process of letting the town be the town. I mean, it's our town. Okay? And you are to support our wishes. Main streets across America for, in terms of having a main street in Scarborough. <clears throat> I think we all recognize that main streets across America are struggling. And so that consideration should be put forth as well. What are we going to end up with if the TIF goes through? I, like many, are neither for nor against, but I'm asking you with all sincerity to let the town make the decision, please. You know, five-year votes is worth $30 million apiece. If we can't make that commitment, are you going to come up with that $30 million? Or would you rather have the taxpayer vote on this referendum and be responsible? Because we, we can be responsible. We, we can, if you provide the information, we can make a decision by November. So I'm asking you to please let us make that decision. Thank you. I'm Susan Hamill, um, Three Bay Street. I have just a, three points I want to make. Um, there has been a lot of talk about the Downs, and a lot of it has been theoretical up until now because few details have been disclosed. But much of the discussion reviewed the pros and cons and best practices of TIFs. One guiding principle which emerged in many articles, including one that I know um, our town manager had looked at, is that TIFs should not be used for developers, and especially for de developments that would happen anyway. Yet, this is exactly what Scarborough is proposing to do. The second thing is, why are we promoting and accelerating growth in Scarborough, which is what the TIF would actually do? Between 1990 and 2002, Scarborough had 2,000 new housing units um, which were built. And we saw the impact of that rapid growth and how, the, it, how disruptive it was to the community, to the schools, to the roads, and to all the municipal services. And that's why the town passed a growth ordinance limiting the amount of growth that could take place. But in spite of that, in um, January of 2017, the council increased the reserve pool of permits to 500. And over the last two years, We've seen residential growth in this town approaching 1,000 housing units when you count all the single-family homes and all the multi-units. This Crossroads TIF will accelerate that growth. Why are we doing this? Why are we fast-tracking the process without really taking the time to think through what are the impacts of this rapid growth? My last point about the TIFs is something that um, has been mentioned in a lot of the literature if you look up how TIFs in Maine. And that's the Millinocket paper mill TIF. It's highlighted over and over again as an example of a failed TIF. Please don't let Scarborough, this council, this town manager, and Scarborough Downs, the Scarborough Downs TIF become something that future students and citizens read about as another what not to do and be pointed to as an example of a huge wealth transfer from taxpayers to private developers. And um, two of our counselors are running for state office in November. We are watching, and the record of what you do here in Scarborough will affect the, the election booth in November. Good evening. My name is Don Hamill. I live at Bay Street in Pine Point. Uh, 
I too have followed town issues closely the past few years and confess to having witnessed a litany of bad decisions by the council which have contributed to a deteriorating public discourse in the town. Despite the loud public outcry on a host of matters, ranging from land giveaways to our mounting debt burden, the council has repeatedly failed to listen to the public, to follow its wisdom, to serve its interest, or to protect the public's welfare properly. Rather, they've acted according to their own wishes and have often put the interests of a wealthy few private citizens and developers before those of the public at large. This must change. If we keep on our current course, we could turn this town into a place where only the wealthy can afford the rising costs of our housing and taxes. The quality of life in this wonderful town with its storied heritage where early settlers made their living from the land and the sea could be lost forever. I am not a no growth advocate, but our pace of development and growth has simply gotten completely out of hand. The Scarborough Crossroads project and the $150 million TIF pending before the council could span two to three decades and it is the largest and most impactful decision we will ever make as a town. I applaud the council for agreeing to retain an independent advisor to assist them in this process as we requested recently at the last meeting. The ad hoc process we are following to evaluate it, however, including its timing, velocity, and brevity are stupefying and mysterious to me and many others. We have all the time we need to make the right decision on this issue and need to involve all the key stakeholders in it. Where is the public benefit of this TIF in the first place? A community center in phase three sounds a bit like pie in the sky to me. Many experts claim that TIFs should not be granted to developers, period. We should not be bullied by developers and investors who claim this is a once in a lifetime deal that will evaporate if we don't agree to do it now. An effective partnership is a mutually beneficial relationship for its members. The town and its citizens need to be treated like equal partners, not like hostages. Though it's easy to become cynical and dispirited, there is still hope. The system is not broken. It can still work with an engaged electorate who are active participants in the governance of our town, but will fail without one. The antidote to apathy is threefold, a commitment to become fiscally responsible and sustainable as a town, to engage the public in issues and participation in key decisions that affect them, and to build better trust and transparency between the council and the public. I look forward to working to take our town back from those who are trying to take it away from us, to put us on a better trajectory for a successful future together. And in that spirit, I am proud to announce this evening that I am a candidate for town council. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bradley Abbott, live at 51 Pearl Street. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit today about a couple letters that um, we received as commercial landlords in the town uh, that were sent out August 30th and got to us yesterday. Um, I own three different commercial properties in town at uh, 4 Washington, 25 Washington, and uh, 3 Commercial Road. Um, there's a tax assessment that's been done by an out-of-state group um, that this is a, sort of our first notification that that was done. We've uh, received increases in the ranges from 22% to up to over 107% in our tax evaluation. The numbers are pretty shocking as a businessman, someone who tries to budget. And uh, unfortunately, or lucky for me, the way the commercial leasing works, most of those taxes are passed on to my tenants. I have eight, eight different tenants, eight different small businesses in the uh, town that I had to make phone calls today to let them know that their tax bill was going up 100%. This is this isn't a way to run a business, and none of these guys, these small businesses, have planned ahead to deal with that kind of increase. Um, I'm very shocked, and I, I hope that we can do work this in a way that maybe we can progressively 
work through these tax increases, give our business, small businesses time to budget and plan ahead for this, and maybe do a gradual adaptation into the new um, assessments that we received. It was, it was very troubling, uh, given that we have four days to respond to them after a long weekend. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak? Paula O'Brien, Pondview Drive. Um, I know many of you have received a great amount of letters and phone calls and people speaking here tonight. And I know you monitor pages like the Supporters of Scarborough Schools, the Road to Renewal, and the Concerned Taxpayers page. I, I know you monitor those to see the comments. Um, I'm neither for nor against the TIF because like much of the public, I don't know a lot about it. However, um, when we were to approve um, the budget or the police station, it was put out there in neighborhood meetings to help the public understand the details of those things. And I just wonder why you can't do the same thing with this once you have the details. I just feel that once the details are becoming public, it's too short a time for anyone to make decisions, and I think the public would feel more comfortable if those neighborhood meetings or something was held to help them understand, because it is a lot of money. I mean, it, it's, I, I don't know, what is it, one-fourth of, the, the budget's one-fourth of that or a third of that, but it, I just think that it needs to slow down and not get pushed through right away. And I kind of liken it to standing at the edge of a cliff with water below and jumping off, not knowing how deep it is. And when you hit the bottom, you're either going to go in the water and be okay, or you're going to hit, hit the bottom and it's three feet deep and you're not okay. So I, I just... I'm just appealing on the behalf of the public to just slow it down and help educate the public. Thank you. Thank you. Could I have one last question? Uh, I oh, think I'm we have now. we have speakers. Yeah. My name is Mo Erickson. I live at 288 Pine Point Road. I have a couple different things I want to bring up today. Now that summer's over, I. Um, want to thank you all for doing nothing about the parking on Pine Point Road. Once again, this has been the third summer where parking has gone all the way up to the bridge, sometimes on both sides from the rotary at the Clambake, all the way up. And um, it's a mess. And I really wish you guys would come down there some Saturday and Sunday and see how dangerous having parking on both sides of that road is. I know that um, parking was banned on Black Point Road and I can tell you that there's a heck of a lot more foot traffic and bike traffic on the Pine Point Road than on the Black Point Road. I can promise you that. Ask the 5,000 campers that go to Bailey's campground every weekend. Um, the next thing I want to bring up is the debacle of parking at Bailey's Lobster Shed and Bailey's Lobster Pound. It was a mess all summer once again, and it has ruined the neighborhood. And if you don't believe me, ask the three people who have just put their houses up for sale. People are out there drinking and smoking cigarettes and whatever else, and it's a neighborhood. I know that it's a zone for business, um, but I don't think the people that live in the neighborhood appreciate it. And it's soon moving down right over to Salty Bay, and the same thing is happening in that two streets over. Um, it's just discouraging to know that you, you, know, you might live, live there and all day long, you're, all night long, you're listening to um, people yelling and screaming at the bar and the parking in the road is, is just crazy. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up is um, the whole idea. I'm sure that the Rizbaras and the Mishus, I know they're smart people and, and I know they wouldn't have bought that property over at Scarborough Downs unless they had gotten, somehow they had been led to believe that this, this whole building project was going to pass. And I think um, it's a shame. Shame on your council members who told the, the, pro the uh, builders that this was going to happen. Because now that people are raising a ruckus about it, I saw one of the Riz Bears um, pretty much bully a, 
uh, ordinance member the other night on TV saying that it was his property and he was going to build something on it. And though I respect that, that it is his property, I think it, it, it's come about the wrong way. And I really feel like, once again, town council members have made deals under the table um, to people and um, they should stop doing that. It's not okay. And I, I don't know why we have to grow so much. And why do we need a, a main street? This Scarborough's 360 years old. We've never had a main street before, and I don't think we need one now. Um, but I will say this. I thank God every day when I drive by the marsh because I know we can't develop that. Thank God. Thank you. Yeah, yes, you may. I'm hoping after this meeting that the council and town manager can think about what it would be like to be sitting on this side of the table here. Um, we're seeing the same stuff that, that well, we know as much as we can know, and that's not a lot, but the pieces that keep popping up, and one of them for me is the tough one, is with Rosvera, where he said that time is short and the project may have to be scuttled. So, you know, it's a little bit of a threat. That's not a good way to bring the community together. And, and if it needs to be scuttled, scuttled, possibly that's an okay thing as well. So, this is not about a <coughs> round one, round two, round three, win or lose. I hope you all sit on this side of the table tonight and get a feeling for how the residents feel about lack of opportunity to be involved. Thank you. Anyone further wishing to speak? Close public comment. Oh, yeah. Anyone uh, else wishing to speak, please line up. Good evening. My name is Philip Reed, and I live at uh, Lane by the Sea in Scarborough. And uh, I first learned about this uh, TIF thing at the last meeting. And um, one question keeps coming up in my mind, and that is, what is the compelling interest of the town in getting involved with this? I, I haven't seen it. Uh, you know, we don't have a main street. Uh, we don't have a community center, but, you know, big deal. Is it worth uh, gambling uh, $150 million in, in tax payments over that? Um, and I, I think the, if it does pass, I think the only thing it's going to do is accelerate the pace of that project. It's going to develop faster. And uh, we're going to have to deal with the traffic and the ramifications to our schools and our way of life. Um, I, don't, I don't think most people in this town want rapid growth. And there seems to be a contrary opinion, at least it's my reading, on the part of some council members. Thank you. Thank you. See no one else. Close the public comment period. Uh, minutes of August 15, 2018, regular town council meeting, and the August 29, 2018, special town council meeting. I'll take them together without any objection. I'll accept the motion. Move approval as written. Second. Any amendments, comments? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Adjustments to the agenda. There are none <clears throat> items to be signed. If the treasurer's warrants here, which I will sign later. <clears throat> Order 18-58, 7 o'clock public hearing in action on the following request for a food handler's license from Sebago Brewing Company, located at 201 South Point Drive, and I'd ask the town clerk to introduce this matter. Yes, uh, this is before you this evening because the... Um they were late in applying for their license. And pursuant to the ordinance, uh, it requires them to reapply as if it was a new license. Everything is in order, and I recommend that it be, be, be approved. 
Good. Public comment on the matter before us. Seeing none, accept the motion. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion? Anything? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. <clears throat> Old business, not at this time. New business. Order 18-59. Act on the request to adopt the new proposed financial and fiscal policy. And I would ask for anyone in the audience who wishes to address this matter. It was on the agenda at our last meeting, some discussion. So uh, we wanted to put it off adoption until this meeting so that people would have more of an opportunity to uh, learn what the elements of the fiscal policy were. So anyone wishing to speak to it, please approach the podium. Seeing none, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion. Uh, this would generally lead off by our chairman of our finance committee giving us a rundown on this. Thank you. Yeah, yes, good evening. Um, actually, we, we, we did discuss this the last meeting, but the, the finance committee has been working on this for three years, probably. Four. Four years. Um, Sean, Chris, and I. Um, and what we, what we ended up doing is really taking four policies that had sort of existed and tried to collapse them into one policy so it could be more concise and clear. And it really took the debt management policy, the investment policy, the fund balance policy and the capital planning policy and kind of put them all into one. It's real exciting reading. I'm sure everybody's gone through it. Um, but one thing we are, we, we've really worked hard to do, and, and one of our goals was really, can we put some metrics into these policies so we can actually measure the financial performance of the town over time? So we can take a look at what our, our debt loads are and some other things. It wasn't done with just our work. We also had some outside consultants, our financial, our, our bond underwriter, and others working with us. So we think this is this is a start, and, and the metrics that we have were developed in collaboration. Larissa Crockett did a great job of putting it together for us. The metrics are meant to be sort of a work in progress. We're going to take a look at them once a year. They're only a guideline. We're going to adjust them as we go along. But it really was an attempt to be it, when we do report out to the council that we can in and, and a one-pager or two-pager, get a real clear picture of where we are financially. And with that, I turn it over to my fellow committee members, if they have any comments, thoughts. Anything further? Yeah, um, uh, I just want to say, I mean, we started this a long time ago, so this is uh, a perfect segue. You know, as a growing community, it's very important that we understand our fiscal uh, stability <laughs> and also a strategy around that. And so the underlying tone to this uh, change of the consolidation really has been the influence of the credit markets and what we can do to understand that market better so that uh, we can um, ebb any tides um, and uh, grow when it's absolutely possible. So uh, I really commend the work. Um, you know, the assistant manager, uh, Larissa Crockett, was a very big help in understanding benchmarks and what those might be. I just hope that people do understand that when it comes to a policy, it's not a um, steadfast mark. It's a benchmark in which you measure yourself and try to understand what is your appetite and what is your target so that you can then respond because, in essence, a credit agency doesn't sit there and say, well, because you broke your policy of X and you're at Y, um, therefore we're going to downgrade you. They're going to ask you what is your strategy to becoming compliant with your own policy and how do you get to that and what was the cause of that. And so it's really understanding that strategic approach to fiscal management. And so, um, you know, I want to commend the staff and, and their guidance in doing this over a four-year period. Um, the good part has been is that our committee has really stayed very stable with the three of us. So we've been able to, you know, continue that knowledge base to present what we have tonight. So uh, thanks to Peter at being the chair for the last two years. Thank you, Sean. Uh, other comments? Chris? Yeah, I mean, I guess I just, I'd like to, I don't want to beat a dead horse and reiterate it, but I think it, oftentimes it goes unsaid. We hear a lot of discourse in the community about how divided the council is. I'll, I, I will say um, we did have some pretty uh, interesting yeah. discussions on finance, but at the end of the day, we collectively came together and we all had what uh, we felt was in the best interest of the town. And a lot of times that goes under the radar. So one of the, one of the things I'm proud of most of all um, in my three years here, one of the things is being able to work together and develop some sound financial policy and put it in writing and put it in into practice. So um, I do thank Peter for his leadership and, and Sean for his steadfastness as well. Steadfastness as well. Um, we did have some interesting meetings, but at the end of the day, we, you know, we, we, we collectively, we debated the issues, we came together, 
And I think we put together a really sound, positive policy, and I think it will stand the test of time. I really do. Thank you. Other comments? I, I just wanted to mention, just as a final note, because it's, it's nice to hear outside of our own compliments, and that is that bond council is very complimentary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they represent the bonding, uh, the agency, and th those who buy our bonds when we go out, and he was very complimentary of our policy um, and the structure of that. So that alone was a, a significant, uh, I think, aspect of moving this forward. Other comments? Councilor Gettery. Uh, yeah, I know that the uh, Finance Committee's been working on this for a long, long time. <laughs> Um, and uh, the fact that the uh, bond, our bond advisor um, thinks these are good uh, makes me feel good about them too. I don't. I will be the first one to tell you that I know just enough to be dangerous. I didn't take that many finance classes as an undergrad, but I took a couple. Um, and um, thank you for all the work in doing that because I do know it's been a slog for you guys. For the comments. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, express appreciation. I think it's a really thoughtful policy. Um, I had some questions about the metrics that were answered at first reading, um, and so I have uh, no real further questions or criticism, and I'll support it tonight. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, I would say that uh, the audience probably may not be aware of, but uh, the committee itself is very skilled professionally and, and really... Uh, all three uh, business people with uh, long periods of time with finance and business and banking. And so we're lucky to have the three of them uh, who've dedicated this time to uh, update this important policy. So thank you. Uh, further comment, question? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Non item eight on the agenda is non action items. There are none. Uh, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports, and start down with Council Bayback. Sure. Uh, the only item tonight um, is the appointments and negotiations committee. Um, I would like to post the following. We did meet this um, this evening. Uh, for Board of Assessment and Review, there are three openings a full voting member, first alternate, and a second alternate. And we would recommend that Melinda Torrens. Um, be named as a full voting member um, with a term to expire in 2018. Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee, there is one opening for a second alternate. We would recommend that Howard Gray be appointed as a second alternate, I apologize, um, with a term to expire in 2020. Housing Alliance, we would recommend for, as a full voting member, Deborah Jean Grew with a term to expire in 2018. The Senior Advisory Board, there are three openings. Uh, for, uh, one full voting member, first and second alternates. We'd recommend that Anne Marie Bailey be appointed as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020. On the Zoning Board of Appeals, we have two openings with a full voting member and a second alternate. We'd recommend. Am I missing something? Oh, sorry. Just want to make sure. Um, we would recommend that uh, Rudy Karen be appointed as a full voting member with a term to expire in 2020. Um, did want to mention also that um, Susan Augulis, who is a current voting member of the planning board as a first alternate, um, has uh, regretfully submitted her resignation. And we um, uh, recommend that Richard du Dupere, if I pronounce that correctly, apologize, incorrectly, I apologize, uh, from second alternate to first alternate with a term to expire in 2020, and to appoint Joel Simons as a second alternate to fill a term to expire in 2019. Um, and um, Last but not least, I did want to mention that there are several vacancies. Mm -hmm. On the Board of Assessment Review, we have a first alternate and second alternate opening. On the Cable Television Committee, a first and second alternate position. Personnel Appeals Board, a second alternate. And Senior Advisory Board as a first alternate and second alternate. Um, with that, as chair, um, it is unanimous amongst the committee. We would really like to extend our gratitude to Susan Oglis, who has served on the planning board. Um, at least 20 years, if not greater. I know she was a staple when I first came on in 99, and she has been a, a treasure of experience and knowledge um, over the years um, in leading us uh, through the planning process, so we do want to thank her expressively um, in, in what she has done for us. Thank you. I think we all joined in that, that uh, appreciation. Thank you. Um, so Scarborough Housing Alliance met um, at the end of August. Um, we had um, Piper Shore there 
uh, representatives from Piper Shores, um, and uh, we discussed um, the in lieu fee and uh, potential uh, for increasing it. Um, I think that uh, the conclusion that we came to was that um, that that's going to be a longer term process. That that when when that in lieu fee was set, it was based on um, it was actually based on the development transfer fee, um, and uh, and that that actually had. Um, numbers behind it. Other communities have set uh, in lieu fees, um, and they haven't really had a had a basis for it. And so we're still kind of debating how we want that to move forward. It's a lengthy process. It'll need to go to ordinance after we make a recommendation. Um, so ultimately, what we came away with was that um, that committee wouldn't really have a, a recommendation that would impact um, any kind of um, uh, contract zone agreement with um, Piper Shores. Um, the point that we uh, made while they were in the room was that that committee really prefers um, that they build the housing. We don't want the in-lieu fee. We want the affordable housing built. We'd love to see the, the senior affordable housing. Um, and um, um, uh, particularly, there's a, there's a huge need there. Uh, and there's a healthy discussion around how that might happen. Um, I suspect that um, Piper Shore has been fairly adamant or, or represented that they're fairly adamant that that, that that is not something that they want to do. Um, and uh, the point was also made to them that if this were a typical zone and they were asking for that type of density, not that it's available, available in RF, but that they would be, um, if it were a uh, zone like a, a T uh, town or village center zone, um, that uh, the type of in lieu fee that they would need to pay would be considerably higher than what's actually on the table. Um, and so um, the point was made. And we had a, a very amicable discussion. I really want to um, thank them for participating. Um, we also made the point um, to that committee, or I made the point to that committee, that this is also a, a uh, terrific um, you know, participant in our community, um, and that we're really happy with um, Piper Shore in general. They, they really have been a great neighbor, um, and that, um, that we didn't want to disadvantage them, that we really wanted to just come to some kind of fair agreement. Um, but that, uh, that committee completely punted, and it's back to the town council, so apologies for that. Um, Historic Preservation Implementation Committee met last night. Um, there w will be uh, an open house at the Honeywell House on September 22nd between 11.30 and 2.30, um, and that's going to be staffed by a couple members of that committee. Um, there was a request from um, the Libby family that they're having a reunion that weekend, and they wanted to go in and see it. Um, and so they wanted to, as a committee, we'd like to have that open to the public more frequently than it is. Um, and so um, uh, one of our um, town treasurers, Becky Delaware, is actually going to be giving a couple talks about the history of the Honeywell House, uh, and then people will get a chance to look inside. So um, it's September 22nd, 11.30 to 2.30, um, stop by. We also discussed the uh, comp plan. Uh, there was some concern about the language in there. Um, and. Um, uh, I think we'll have some feedback um, for the uh, Long Range Planning Committee. Um, uh, we also discussed um, where we actually want to go with some kind of sign program and, and what it is that we'd like to target. Um, and so we're hoping to get further along with that next month in terms of just identifying neighborhoods and towns, and, or excuse me, neighborhoods and homes and, and buildings in town. Um, we also had a discussion around the um, the grist mill or the remains of the grist mill that used to be on Mill Creek um, on the um, on the property that is now um, the Scarborough Downs Crossroads ownership that has had um, considerable comment tonight. Um, and the committee, while they were they were not terribly pleased with um, the. Uh, response, there's a feeling that maybe there's something there. Uh, they really don't have any evidence that there actually is, and so we're, we're not going to take further action at this time to request further investigation than what the developer has done already since it was brought to their attention. So, that's it. Thank you. That's sure. the I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have much. Um, no committees have met since the last time we met. The Eastern Trail Alliance is wrapping up their last big event of the summer. Um, with the lighthouse ride, there's still time to get, out, get your bike out and go for a ride uh, to view our beautiful lighthouses. And I will be at one of the water stations. So mm -hmm. I'm volunteering for that event this weekend. Looking forward to it. That's it. Thank you. Sounds good, Katarina. Um, I was, have been away, um, so I have nothing to report tonight other than communications will be meeting on uh, 9 13 
4.30, I think. I can't remember. And then ordinance will be meeting on September 20th, and I'll have more information on the 9-12 meeting as to... Uh, anyway, there'll be information coming out on what will be on the finance committee. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, nothing really to report. I, I will report the finance committee. We've, we've had a couple meetings scheduled and postponed. We've been involved in some other discussions that have kind of... We, Kind of rearrange the schedule so we will get back to you when we're going to meet next. So, with that, thank you. Councilor uh, Kaiser. So, transportation and energy net, uh, since the last meeting, um, both are very much focused on the comprehensive plan and doing their updates for those sections of the plans. Those are uh, for, first and foremost on committee minds, with the understanding that uh, a lot of that feedback has to go back to long range planning for uh, assembly and then resubmission to the consultant for um, updates and changes. Uh, I would encourage the public to send your uh, suggestions in. This is your opportunity now while it's being formed. Go online, um, speak to one of the counselors, speak to anybody in, uh, on staff in terms of any questions or concerns or details that you need because really this is our opportunity right now as a community to, to give feedback. So that's where I am. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Babine identified uh, the names that are being posted tonight. We'll vote on those at the next meeting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I forgot. Uh, actually, um, I can't believe I forgot the cable TV committee. Um, one of my favorite committees, but yeah. I did want to mention. <laughs> did want to mention that we did have a meeting in which we are moving forward. Um, our goal is that by probably the first meeting in November, we are hoping to present to the council a document that re um, what's the word reorganizes or restructures kind of the foundation of how it was originally composed because um, there's ordinances and charters and all these other kind of approaches from the 1970s. Um, so uh, we will be coming forward and uh, uh, presenting something because um, we're making very good progress. Excellent. Uh, pest management uh, uh, met uh, this uh, in recent weeks uh, and I'm the liaison to that committee. Uh, pest management really is a committee that is implementing our organics focused policy for municipal properties, lawns, fields, gardens, uh, and uh, uh, I appointed myself to this, uh, I guess, a year ago, uh, and uh, I hadn't really ever attended any of their meetings before, but uh, Todd Souza, the new commu uh, community services director, uh, I've been very impressed, and people should know that he runs a very organized meeting. The, the meetings are efficient uh, and very focused. Uh, it's, as you would imagine, it's turf management, uh, uh, focusing on uh, ways in which the uh, uh, DPW in town can deal with, whether it's weeds or weeding or beds. Uh, it's, it's a lot of uh, uh, roll up your sleeve kind of stuff. Uh, we have had this committee in place now for five years, uh, and the expectation, I think, is that we're going to look for a report from them uh, in the months ahead, and they are starting to work on it, uh, so that we can get a sense of, are we making progress? What's it costing us? Uh, and those are really the, the, the questions. Is, is the quality of the turf uh, uh, getting stronger? Uh, uh, how are we doing as far as exceptions when we have to make them and under what circumstances we have to make them uh, so that the town is acting very much like a guinea pig to try and understand where is this going? How far, how fast is the industry of turf, turf management going uh, and, uh, and landscaping? Uh, because these are issues that I think are important to everybody. So that's the report on that. Uh, and I'll handle that at, okay. at, the, at the end. Town Manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Just a couple of points of interest. Um, with respect to the commercial industrial reval, uh, we did have a private outside consultant work for the last six months or so to come up with new values for all properties in that classification. Uh, the consultant did provide those numbers to us uh, in the middle of last week and they were sent uh, directly out to the property owners advising them of what the new values are. 
Uh, I do apologize for a fairly short turnaround, a holiday weekend in the middle. I appreciate the sensitivity around that. We have scheduled three different days for property owners to come in and meet with our consultants and staff to understand what's been done and an opportunity to make adjustments. I certainly hope uh, anyone that questions those new values takes advantage of that opportunity. Uh, our intent would be to certainly correct any errors or oversights before we commit taxes. Uh, even if there are something that slips through, we certainly can handle abatements after the fact as well. But um, we, again, hope that everyone avails themselves of that opportunity to understand what's been done and uh, provide additional information to us if we have something in error. Um, that, incidentally, um, is the final piece before we go to tax, final tax commitment and sending out tax bills. So uh, we're trying to stay on a fairly tight schedule just to make sure we give proper uh, notice to taxpayers in time for them to make those first half tax payments. A couple other quick little highlights. Uh, some of you may have noticed for the last couple of weeks the fountains at the park, uh, the pond in the park have been off. We had a terrible algae bloom uh, this summer, so much so the fountains were kind of choked out by the vegetative matter. So uh, really to preserve the pumps, we turned them off. We, we do have some remedial work that will start this Friday, essentially uh, skimming the algae and removing it and we're looking to possibly treat the water to, uh, to help um, prevent that sort of bloom from happening in the, in the future. Uh, the public safety project, uh, we're kind of in a, in a strange spot right now. We're continuing to review the final numbers. We're, the committee's confident that they will make budget, uh, but that's still in process with the design team. The DEP, DEP permit is not in hand yet, but uh, we're told it's in process. We expect it within the next week to 10 days. And we're tentatively looking at a groundbreaking ceremony in late September. Um, when we know more of these details, we'll certainly get that word out. Uh, but we'd like to celebrate that, uh, that occasion. And lastly, just uh, details yet to, to come, but the town will be undertaking further work on Gorm Road. All the work that we've endured this past summer is uh, UNTIL. It's nothing that we had to do with, uh, anything to do with. Um, I think you'll find our work won't be quite as intrusive. There'll be a couple of crossings that will necessitate some uh, lane closures, but we intend to have traffic flowing at all times, and we'll do our part to uh, get adequate notice about the duration and the scope of those projects when we have the details. Thank you. Councillor, uh, uh, comments? Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I can ask the manager, can, can the manager clarify in his reports what communication was undertaken prior to the work effort um, around the commercial yeah. Uh, evaluation because that was part of the comment that was made earlier I think should be clarified yeah I believe communications were made uh, made out at the front end of this process I'll confirm those details but my strong recollection is that we did communicate out to property owners that, that we were undertaking this and that uh, really looking for the cooperation we attempted to gain access and entry into every property we weren't successful in all cases uh, but I believe we've made every effort through the process to make people aware that it was underway thank you thank you I think it's also important to emphasize that uh, the opportunity uh, for the three days of uh, hearings really are meetings because uh, the company is going to make themselves available. If there are errors in the uh, financial analysis that was done, let's get them fixed. But that doesn't waive every property owner's rights to uh, take a tax abatement appeal uh, and go through the whole process. So that. Uh, there, there is no expediting of that process. Yeah, just to be clear, these aren't formal hearings. These are meetings really for information sharing and to understand. And, and clearly, if we've made some errors, we're, we're prepared to make those changes. Uh, and I guess the final point, uh, values are really derived using the three different methods to, to derive value. For commercial industrial properties, we have the ability to look at the income approach, the cost approach, and then sales is kind of a further validation not always is helpful when it comes to uh, commercial industrial properties, uh, but I, I hope taxpayers, they may not be pleased with the new values. Um, it's been a while since we've looked at them, but I hope they're uh, comforted by the fact that there's good documentation and support for what's been done. Thank you. Councilor Cummins, Councilor Gaza. Yeah, so um, I did want to try and reply as best I could to some of the comments that were at the podium tonight. Um, and again, not necessarily to be um, Argumentative, but maybe to kind of hopefully set the record straight on a few things that I that I did hear. Um, one of the comments I heard was that the town shouldn't be bullied by developers, and I, I wish the Crossroads people were still here because 
uh, I think they would hopefully concur that they haven't really bullied us because if they had, the outcome might be a little different than where we're at right now. So I certainly don't feel like we've been bullied. I think it's, um, you know, we're in discussions and I think those have been amicable and uh, professional. Um, and uh, I, I certainly don't feel like I've been bullied by any stretch of the imagination. Um, second thing I wanted to, to, to comment on was, um, there was a comment that developers were probably told by the council that a um, agreement would pass before they bought the property and that the deal was made under the table. I had no conversation, such conversation with developers. I would be hard pressed to think any of my fellow councilors did, but mm -hmm. certainly if that were the case, uh, I'd like to see some evidence come out. And uh, if that is in fact the case, we'll approach that and deal with that as needed. But I just want to be very cautious of how we make statements and, and what we acknowledge in public because I think it's important to understand that, um, you, you know, we all have the best interests of the town at heart. Uh, I, I think we're in a very um, positive position with the developers. It, having said that, I don't think that we're, we're, we're certainly approaching this as a business perspective. I know for, I can speak for myself personally that we're looking at uh, aspects of it to make sure that the town is represented fairly and equitably, uh, and that we're not being taken advantage of. And I, I don't foresee us um, changing that um, in, in any near future. Um, finally, there was a question about, um, there was a comment that made said, no town center, no community center, so what? Um, and I've heard that as well out in the community a little bit. What's the value of a town center? Why are we even talking about this now? Uh, it has been a part of the comprehensive plan. It was part of the 2006 comprehensive plan. It was clearly documented. The comprehensive plan, while not a mandate, it certainly is a guideline for development in this town. And both in the previous comprehensive plan as well as the, the draft of this year's, uh, or the cycle's version of it, uh, it's been very articulated very clearly what the goals of the community are, and that was vetted in the community, and this one will be as well. So I, I don't want to give the impression that, um, certainly from my perspective, that uh, this is a pie in the sky thing, that it's just something that we'd like to see and it's nice to have. I think we do have uh, a, a, a precedent and a, and a documentation and a history showing that these were issues that were important to the community and still are important to the community. The real question is, is what's that worth and what's the value of that? And I think we're still in the process of determining that. So uh, I just want to be clear that you know this is not from my, certainly from my perspective, and I haven't heard anything from my fellow councilors saying this is just our decision to, to craft the town or you know, do what we want to do with it. Um, secondly, I just wanted to comment on, on, on Susan uh, Augulus. Uh, I've served with her on a couple of committees. Um, my first thought, and some of you may get this and some of you may not, um, uh, the reference to Madame Defarge struck me uh, from a, a, the character in A Tale of Two Cities. Um, while she may have been a villain, uh, and probably was to some of the developers who went up against her, uh, I certainly saw her, uh, and still do see her, as a, a very positive impact on this community, and someone who's uh, certainly dedicated, tireless, and very passionate about her position, and, and, and always served with the best interests of the town at heart. So I want to thank her for her service, and her continued service. I know she's going to still serve on a few boards together. And finally, if, if you can't laugh at yourself and make fun of yourself, then we probably shouldn't be up here. Yeah. I would love to see the town sponsor a best meme contest for tonight's picture of the council with a police <laughs> photographer. Uh, and the winner should be posted on the town website yeah, with a <laughs> caption. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so be it, so be it. So uh, I'd just like to put that forward as something to consider. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I think I'll just be quick and just kind of, I, I do want to thank everybody that came out and, and spoke to us tonight. I know it's not, it's not easy getting up at the podium. It's not easy talking. So we certainly want your input. This is probably, I think one of the speakers did speak to it. This is a significant issue for the town of Scarborough. It's a big project. It's a 30 year sort of reshaping or shaping our town of what it's going to be. I, for one, certainly want to hear from all of you and what you're thinking and get your input. It, we're all in this together. It should be a community decision on, on what we decide to do. So thanks for coming out. Thanks for staying engaged. It's great to see people engaged. Usually it's very lonely up here. We have one or two people in the audience. So it's <laughs> great to see folks out and about. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Caterina. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, add my own two cents worth to the comments of the gentleman previous. For those of you who have, don't know me 
that well or haven't heard me, I really don't like TIFFs and I don't like credit enhancements. Um, the only way I would support anything like that is if there was a significant public interest to them. That being said, uh, it's very disturbing to me personally when people get up there and say, you people don't do your homework, you're you know, being told what to do by, by developers and whatever. To be honest with you, I was away for almost a month and I spent almost that whole month, not every minute of the month, I'll admit to that, but uh, reading up on, on materials that I was provided um, on, on the upside and downside of TIFFs and credit enhancements um, 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 agreements that are done uh, with developers. Um, a couple of things about those are, um, one, a TIFF and a credit uh, enhancement are two different animals. You can't have a credit enhancement without a TIFF. You can have a TIF without giving money back to developers. So that's something to be aware of. And there is a, a really good uh, write-up on TIFFs on the town website on the very front page. So if you want to check that out, you know, get up to speed on, on what TIFFs are and aren't because there is a lot of uh, misinformation about there. I know, for example, someone got up tonight and spoke about Millinocket. Well, that's a totally different type of TIF. So you got to, you know, um, just pay attention to that, and that's one of the things you know that we work on as as a council. Also, you also need to understand that uh, I, as you, as you may or may not know, I'm a real estate broker. Um, negotiations, real estate negotiations, are confidential. We don't run around telling people what we're negotiating for or against or whatever. We're in the same boat here uh, with this TIF. The negotiations are confidential, so that's why you haven't had all of this information going out because nothing's been decided. And it, it drives me crazy to hear, oh, well, I know that the council's made this decision and we're going to do this and this is, you know, this was done up front and the, and the uh, developer bought this land knowing they were going to get this, that, and the other thing, and that's not true. So you need to understand that. Um, also, um, I do want to thank Susan Ockles also for the work that she has done uh, on the planning board. I know that she is the bete noir <laughs> or the Madame Defarge for some of the developers in town, um, but she's been a very uh, powerful voice on the planning board. So I do want to thank her for her work on that, and I look forward to uh, working with her uh, on some of the committees that she is staying with. And that's it for me. Thank you. Councillor Foley. Um, I'm going to start a little differently than my fellow counselors. I want to first say I think tonight we're going to get the final list of uh, those who have submitted their papers for running for the Board of Education and Town Council. And if I'm correct, uh, what I saw this afternoon, we may have a record uh, turnout of people running for various offices. And I have to say, in my opinion, that is a hap it's, it's a welcome blessing. It's uh, good to have a robust um, election in front of us, and I look forward to that. Uh, I think getting more people involved and engaged has been certainly a goal of mine um, and part of why I ran for council in the first place. So I'm really pleased to see that and thank you all for sticking your neck out and, and putting yourself out there because it is not easy and it's not always fun. So uh, good luck to all the candidates um, as they move forward in their campaigns. Um, I think some of my fellow councillors summed up some of my feelings, although I think I, I take a little little different approach uh, with some of the comments that we heard from the podium tonight in that while I may not agree um, with some of them, I completely understand why there is a lack of trust at times um, and why even some of that may have been earned at times, but not always. And what I would say and encourage everyone is to stay open-minded, to continue the dialogue that has started because I do feel like we're making progress and some things are getting better. Um, I do think everyone behind this table has spent a significant amount of time um, trying to learn and understand the differences between the TIFs and the CEAs and all the different nuances because they are not all created equal. Um, I can promise you that everyone behind the table does want what's best for the town uh, and that in, as far as I know no deals have been made. Um, the last thing I will say and it probably won't be popular but it's absolutely true. 
uh, for me, and I can only speak for me, and that is I have felt uh, pressured and threatened by sometimes the language used by the developers, and I'm free to say that because I've told them that to their face. <laughs> uh, I think they should take a different approach. I think they should be trying to get the town to work with them. I think this could be the best project that ever happened to this town if we do it together, because for me, that's what collaboration means. It's we do it together. If you want a partnership, let's do this together. Um, so that's what I'm hopeful for. I think it can still happen. I, I know when they came up to us uh, for the zoning decision we had to make, there was a rush time frame there. And um, we gave it to them, we, we passed it. But even at that time, we all said, or many of us said, um, you know, please don't rush us through again and give us the time that we need to partner with you. So um, I'm hoping that, that that spirit can ring true as we move forward. So um, I want to take our time. I'm not going to support something that I don't think is in the town's best interest. So um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Councilor Rowe. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to express gratitude. I uh, appreciate all the speakers who came out tonight. Um, it, I think there were some really valid points made around um, you know, the, the speed or the encouragement of the rapid growth as well as um, community input. Um, I think that, um, uh, the, that we haven't had a lot of opportunity to um, uh, share uh, information because a lot of it's been, been very proprietary um, and it's been requested that we, that we not. We've had one um, executive uh, meeting, or executive session, uh, where we really got to dig in. There was a lot of analysis that was done by the town and we got to take a look at that and I'm hoping that that can be as much as possible of that. Um, can be shared, and then we're, we are, um, you know, we're continuing to move in um, to an analysis phase um, at this point. Um, and really, the the analysis is around that negotiated starting point. That's not a decision that's been made. It's really just like where, what, where can we be? We're we're trying to analyze um, uh, where that benefit is in terms of the the civic space and the town square and the and the uh, you know the walkable mixed use neighborhood. Um, but I think the, the point also needs to be made that this is a, a 500 acre parcel of land that is um, zoned and such a way that it can sustain the, the highest density in the town. And I think that we really want to think carefully around um, the uh, level of engagement that we have with the people that are developing there so that we can have a positive um, impact. But I certainly want to make sure that there's benefit that's commensurate with whatever we're spending in, in terms of costs. And I, I certainly am not at a place where I've made any decisions. And so I really, again, appreciate uh, the thoughtful comments tonight. And um, we'll definitely keep that in mind. Mr. Uh Thanks. Um, first, um, I wanted to mention that we attended, if you didn't see the picture of the paper, we attended the opening, the grand opening of the uh, senior um, programs section of the community park which is absolutely wonderful. We've been in the works of uh, really getting that up and running and funding, I want to say five, maybe six years, because I think that it was even before I came back in 2014 that we started at least approved the original $100,000. So, you know, uh, thanks to Todd Souza and the rest of his crew. And um, it's absolutely, absolutely beautiful if you get the chance. There's also, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, and under budget. And under budget, it is under budget. Um, and there's a wonderful Eagle project that was done also that kind of connects into that whole uh, part of it. Um, so I think it's really, really nice um, and, a, and a great um, new addition to the community. And every time I've driven by, that um, at least that pickleball court looks interesting. I'm not a senior yet, getting there close. Um, I might have to take that up because it was, it was pretty energizing, so it was pretty cool. Um, but I want to say thanks to everyone. There was quite a nice council contingency that was there as well. And I did want to mention, I think it's um, nice to hear from other councillors who brought up aspects of the comments. First, um, thank you. Um, it's always wonderful to hear from people. I've been getting a lot of emails as well and trying to respond. And I do want to recommend that if anybody wants to um, understand, at least my understanding of what, um, there are three distinctive issues here. One is the designation not of a main street, but of a downtown district. There's a designation of a TIF zone, mm -hmm. which is not about taxes or expenses. And then there is the credit enhancement agreement, which is not even about expenses. It's about revenue sharing. They're very, three very <coughs> distinct issues. Tonight's executive committee um, meeting is on the credit enhancement piece, which is about revenue sharing. It's not about increased expenses. There is no increased expense to this community as a result of this project. I do want to also make clear, and anybody can give me a call, my number is published, they can call me on my cell phone, 274-0805, I'd love to talk to you, have a cup of coffee. And that is that, 
I don't look at the developer's statement about, well, if we don't do this, then we're not going to do it. But I believe that what they're saying is that what, if we don't do the credit enhancement, then they're not going to do the credit enhancement. They can still develop on that property under what is permissible according to the 2006 and the 2018 comprehensive plans. So something will be developed. It might not be as big and grand as what they're suggesting with the credit enhancement, but something will be developed. And those standards are not decided by this town council by any means. Not one aspect of it is decided by this council. It's the planning board that decides it at each one of those phases. So if you're concerned about the impact of schools, the number of school children, um, that, uh, you know, because all of those projections are part of their presentation to the, to the planning board, as well as traffic impact studies and things such as that, um, that's where that is shared. It's not shared at this level. This is about the financial impact of a credit enhancement agreement should we decide to go down that path, no matter what the level is, whether it's $1 or I'm, I don't know where the $150 million came from, but even if it's the $150 million or if it's whatever it is. So I think that we need to understand and we need to do a better job at educating on those three very distinct aspects because they are different um, as part of that. And, um, you know, we have a lot of education to do. Um, I've been here, by the way, um, and I believe I have lived through and been part of every decision for the current TIFs that are in place. And there is already an example of a bad TIF that we did, which was the Highest Parkway, and that's because the town was the developer of the infrastructure and took out bonds to fund that infrastructure. And it failed because of the economy that we did not or was not able to forecast into. So we already have an example of how not to do it. Um, and I, I, I do suspect that we will never do that again, at least as long as I hope I'm around. So, uh, but with that, um, I'll wait for the rest of it to kind of come up, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, when you have statements from the podium that, you know, secret deals are being made, we haven't known enough to know what to do until we've been intensely involved in this in recent months. Uh, so any deals that are purported to have been made at the time this property was purchased in January, it's ludicrous. We didn't even know until after they had purchased the property. Uh, and, and there were no discussions, none with me, and no one else on this council has ever uh, indicated to me that they had made any kind of commitment. We are still in a deliberative process of trying to decide uh, what is the best arrangement here. Credit enhancement agreement? No credit enhancement agreement. Terms of the credit enhancement agreement. And that's what we're working through very deliberatively. Uh, when I hear comments about a lack of trust, what I'm hearing it from, and the audience should really realize this, I'm hearing it from people who've been concerned about other issues in town, and we went another way. And our decisions might have been five to two, or six to one, or seven to nothing. And you can look back over those. But we weren't having four to three votes. We just haven't had them. We've had a super majority to a unanimous vote on virtually every major issue that's come up. And that's easily recognized. So when you, and, and it's the old phrase, Consider the source. When you hear people make those kind of comments, look and say, who is it who's making that comment and when have I seen them before? I think that would, uh, would tell you enough. Uh, uh, an item that uh, uh, is moving forward, but uh, sort of at the planning board at the moment, but uh, which I was involved with, neighbors on uh, Newcomb Ridge, uh, neighbors to the Piper Shores project, uh, have been in touch with me asked me to uh, uh, evaluate some of the impact issues. So I met with uh, one of the representative neighbors out there and, and really have made an effort to try and just facilitate a conversation between the Newcomb Ridge uh, uh, neighborhood and the Piper Shores uh, leadership. And I think it's at least, uh, it seems to be going along uh, well that at least they're talking. And I think that's important because uh, uh, the neighbors who are immediately impacted by a project should have a voice. And so uh, that's, I just wanted people to know that that was going on. Um, lastly, uh, at 6.30 tonight, 
we had the uh, completion of a submission of papers for the various positions that people will be candidates for the November 6th uh, municipal elections. For the town council, which is a three-year uh, uh, term and there are two seats available, uh, the candidates are John Dittmer, Donald Hamill, Hamill, and Paul Johnson, and Robert Rowan, also known as Will Rowan. <laughs> uh, on the Board of Education, three-year uh, term, three seats, John Cloutier, Leroy Crockett, Nicholas Gill, Betsy uh, Gleistein, Lori Lavoie, Sarah Layton, Michael Marcello, Annalie Rosenblatt, April Zither, and Quinn Stewart. For the Board of Education, for the one-year uh, uh, Carrie Lightford term, uh, Amy Glidden and Emily Reed. Uh, Board of Education for the one year remaining on the Jody Shea term, uh, uh, Alicia Giftos, Benjamin Howard, and Stacy Newman are the candidates. For the Portland Water District, it's a trustee position, five years term, and it's one seat available. Seth Garrison is the sole uh, person who has signed up to run for that position. In the Sanitary District Trustees, we have uh, three-year terms and two positions, two seats, and we have two candidates, Nicola Rico and Benedetto Viola. <laughs> and I think I haven't butchered those. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Right. I'm, I'm sure you're And then we have 21 years. He's used and we do <laughs> have a, uh, a school. I know <laughs> Donnelly owns my favorite author recently, and it's all about Italian, so... Nothing wrong with Italian. Nothing, no. <laughs> uh, school referendum question number one. Do you favor the formation of a regional service center pursuant to an interlocal agreement for the Greater Sebago Education Alliance Regional Service Center as approved by the governing bodies of the parties thereto and the commissioner of the Department of Education? And we had a presentation by the superintendent at the last meeting to provide an explanation. So those of you who are saying, what is that? Uh, uh, my suggestion would be to go to the uh, August meeting. And I'm not yeah, so quite sure. 16th? 15th? August 15th, 15th meeting. Right in there and it's online. It's available. Uh, and you will see uh, uh, Julie Kuchenberger give a pretty good rundown on what that's all about. I was just going to mention the candidates night. It's scheduled for Thursday, October 11. Given the field, uh, I'm, it's not my call, but I'm wondering logistically if we're able to do them all. So uh, information will be forthcoming. Just to make sure that we can handle that uh, appropriately so all candidates have equal time. Chamber of Commerce. Day. And we thank the Chamber of Commerce for our annually sponsoring that. That's the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce that uh, gives that as a public service. So with that, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. Um, executive session. Second, sir. What do we got left? Uh, <laughs> ah, thank you. Uh, order 18-60, act on the request for an executive session pursuant to Title I, MRSA 405-6C, in consultation with legal counsel relating to the proposed Downs Credit Enhancement Agreement. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Good. Uh, and we will adjourn from there. Thank you, everyone. No. Uh